Champollion, had arrived in Paris in 1821. Broke, alone, and shunned by fellow academics, he still clings to his theory. I have analyzed this language so much that I could teach it in a single day. I shall prove that words are composed of a series of signs that represent sounds. On December the 23rd, he celebrates his 31st birthday alone. A simple idea crosses his mind. To count the individual characters in the inscriptions. He works out that 486 Greek words correspond to 1,419 hieroglyphs. It seems to him now obvious. Hieroglyphs cannot represent a full word. Each one must represent a sound, a part of the word. but still he lacked the evidence to prove his theory. The material Champollion so desperately needed arrived earlier today on the morning of September the 14th, 1822. receives a letter from his friend, Nicholas Julio. Julio has recently returned from an expedition to Egypt, traveling south in the Sudan to the recently excavated ruins of Abu Simbel. Champollion has never been to Egypt, his work has had to rely on other people's accounts. Puyo's drawings capture the mysterious temple complex. But it is a small detail on the side of one of the sculptures that catches Champollion's attention. Champollion spots a cartouche amidst the numerous hieroglyphics. He knows from the cartouche of Ptolemy on the Rosetta Stone that these lozenge shapes contain names. Champollion is drawn to one of the individual hieroglyphs, a circle within a circle. If the circle were the sun, what sound could it represent? Of all the languages he has studied, Champollion has always believed Coptic, the language of early Christian Egypt, to be closest to ancient Egyptian. In Coptic, the word for the sun is re. Ra. 
change the pronunciation of Re slightly, and you have the name of one of Egypt's ancient deities. Ra! He thinks he has found a symbol that represents the word for Egypt's sun god in a cartouche. He has as a guess. If the second sign is an M, and the last two signs are both S, yes. it means he has successfully deciphered one of the most famous ancient Egyptian royal names. Champollion has not just found the name of an Egyptian pharaoh. He has done something no one else thought possible. He has read a hieroglyph. His mounting excitement is tempered by the dreadful fear that this flash of inspiration may be a fluke. A lucky coincidence to mock his 22 years of fruitless study. Searching the rest of the drawings sent by Huyo, his eye is caught by another cartouche. Above the same signs that he has just assumed to be an M and an S is a picture of a bird. What sound might that represent? The bird of the Nile is the ibis. And in the ancient world, the ibis was used to represent Toth the god of scribes. If the bird is an ibis, then Champollion can read the name in the cartouche. Totmosis. Totmosis. Another royal Egyptian name. At last, he has confirmed and proved his theory. Hieroglyphs represent sounds, which work together to make words which can be spoken. Champollion spends the next four days in bed. But by September the 27th, he will have recovered enough to announce his findings to the Institute of France and the rest of the world. His breakthrough is the first step in the successful translation of the hieroglyphic language of the Rosetta Stone. 
and will provide the foundation for the subsequent exploration and understanding of life in ancient Egypt.